Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves, he's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blowed his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I'm your host, Tony Merkel. Thanks for being here. I'm still struggling and fighting this COVID, so uh, bear with me, friends, for the lack of enthusiasm on these recordings. I am all heart, no windpipes. I have a hard time breathing right now. So if you have a crazy wild experience you want to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the contact section, and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me, just get a hold of me. If you want to hear more shows on a weekly basis, all you got to do is become a member to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. You'll get access to a Thursday show for members only. You'll get access to the Tuesday shows ad free on the Castos app. And you'll get access to the overtime shows that are available when we have a longer conversation with a guest. That's all available to members at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the join button if that interests you. Also, friends, we have preparewiththeconfessionals.com. That's preparewiththeconfessionals.com. There you can get yourself emergency supply food and survival gear. If they had something that could take this crap from my lungs, that'd be great. But they don't have that. But what they do have is emergency supply food and the survival gear. The food will last you up to 25 years on the shelf, and the gear will last as long as you don't use it. It's always good to be prepared just in case that time comes where you're going to need to survive in a rough situation. You'll make sure you and your family are good to go. So you can do that at preparewiththeconfessionals.com. Also check out the YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is growing and we're continuing to try to make it grow. The Dogman documentary will be coming out soon. As soon as I'm better, I'll be talking to the guys about release dates, I'm sure. And if you don't want to miss the Dogman documentary, make sure you're subscribed to that YouTube channel so that you don't miss out on this really good documentary. And before we get into this week's show, friends, I just remind you that we are still doing the Spirits Are In tour on April 8th through the 9th this year, 2022. If you are interested in coming with me to the Stanley Hotel for a haunted night adventure, you're going to want to contact Creed and Jen over at Educated Wanderer. All you got to do is email them travelgrouptours at aol.com or you can call them 973-513-9001 or just hit up their website educatedwanderer.com. Reserve your spot on this trip because the seats are limited and once it fills up, you won't be able to get access to it. So if you've been thinking about coming on the trip with us and going on this overnight adventure, then contact Creed and Jen and get your spot reserved today. Now, today we have Trey coming on the show today, and Trey is a longtime listener of the show, and he and I had a chance to sit down and talk about his investigations and how he got into paranormal investigations, because 
He didn't get into it because he believed in it. He got into it because he wanted to disprove it. And then how he got out of paranormal investigations was because of a Bigfoot encounter he had. Uh, it, it's really an interesting thought process he had as to why he got into paranormal investigating and then also why he got out of paranormal investigating into Bigfoot investigating. It, I'll let him describe it to you guys, but I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Let's get the tray right now. All right, today we got Trey on the show. Trey, what's up, dude? Hey, man, how's it going, Tony? Doing good, man. Doing good, uh, Trey. Man, you've been you've been a fan of the show for a long time, man. I I was just telling my wife before I came down here to talk to you that I remember you contacting me. I think it was in like the first few months of me podcasting, which was you know it feels like forever ago. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's been a while, man. It's been a while. I I love your show, man. And uh, you know, Wes obviously turned me over to it, and I got it to it, and. I don't know, I'm split between you, your two shows now because they're obviously different topics. But yeah, I've uh, been listening for quite a while, quite a while. Well, those are two good shows to be split between. So uh, support, I support your decisions. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, so, man, listen, you were a paranormal investigator, and I know you got into it to prove that it was a bunch of BS. Uh, but if you could just kind of walk us into, you know, the origins of why you started doing all this stuff. And then, you know, we'll get into your experiences and how you feel about the paranormal now that you've been a paranormal investigator before. Uh, so yeah, man, um, I'm going to say it's around 2004, I believe, uh, when the ghost hunter show came out. Um, I had never, ever, I never had an experience my entire life of anything paranormal. And then all of a sudden, here's this show on TV, and you know they're hearing knocks, they're seeing this, and I'm sitting on the couch saying that's bullcrap. You know that could be this, that could be that. And uh, my girlfriend at the time was was like, you know, there are groups around here if you think because she was a she was a firm believer because she had had experiences, and she's like, well, why don't you you know join one of these groups around here and go find out for yourself? And um, so that's basically how it started off. I, I said, you know what? I can't sit here on the an arm, you know, armchair quarterback. This I, I'll go out there and try. So uh, I found a group, uh, ETPRS, which is East Tennessee Paranormal Research Society. Um, you know, joined up with them, um, and it was actually not one of those things that you know you just say, "Hey, I want to be in there." They, they they make you take tests and you know try to look at pictures and see which ones were real orbs and which one. I mean, it was like a it was a a long process but uh finally got into it and that's where uh that's where everything kicked off at so was it um, let me ask you what was it something with the testing and everything to get into this i mean were you honest with them and said well i don't even believe in this stuff to begin with i mean <laughs> i absolutely i was i was known as the the, the heavy skeptic when i started um because I would just try to debunk everything which honestly on a, a, even a place that is truly haunted you can still debunk about 90 to 95 percent of the stuff that goes on i mean even like i said even if it is 100 percent haunted most of the stuff once you get in there your mind starts playing tricks on you but it's that other five percent in there that you just say i i, I don't have a clue what that is i mean i got lucky enough actually uh i think i sent you the video the the very first investigation i went on that i was one of the two leads on there instead of just a background character i caught a full body apparition on camera i saw it with my eyes caught it on camera chased after it and the, the thing just disappeared i mean that was the very first you know introduction i had into actually seeing or hearing anything and and that was shoot it had barely got dark that night it was just it was crazy how i got uh, thrown into that and it's what kind of made me say, well, maybe there is a little something to it, or maybe I'm just, you know, tripping or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that video you sent, was that the one where you were filming it through the window? Is that the one in Philadelphia? That, that's it. I was inside of a barn and uh, I, you know, look up out the window and I see this figure that's um translucent figure because if you slow the video down there's there's one single tree in that entire field and it's just right outside the window there maybe 30 or 40 feet past the window and this thing was moving back and forth and i'm sitting here looking through the 
you know, looking through the viewfinder, then looking up, looking through the viewfinder, shining my light on it. Every time it passes in front of the tree, you can still see the tree behind it. And just at the point that I said, I'm about to go out there and see what this is, it it moved to the right, it turned, and it blinked out. And that's when I took off after it. Of course, the volume's not good on that. I think all you can hear is me falling and busting my butt trying to run out there. <laughs> and uh, we all, I had someone else go around the other back of the barn, and we come out with spotlights that shined all the way down the road uh, a couple hundred yards away. And there's absolutely, absolutely nothing out there but that. And... It was uh, it's definitely an eye opener. It was, I still don't know what to make of it, and but yeah, that was my introduction to to something like that. So, as as somebody who didn't believe in this stuff, your first time going out there, you have this experience where you actually see an apparition, and uh, it, it's you catch it on video and all that stuff. I mean, in that moment. Uh, obviously, like you said, it was, you know, enlightening, like maybe there is something to all this stuff, but w- did you ever have any fear in that moment being that it was your first time out to do like ghost hunting and you actually freaking catch one on video? I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was fear. It was more at that time. It was confusion because I was in complete disbelief. And then right there it is in front of your eyes and it disappears in front of your eyes. And it only took me two to three seconds even though i fell it only took me two to three seconds to get out the barn door you know and there's nothing there and um it was disbelief more than fear i'm you know i'm walking around the field and everybody's like okay it's gone let's go back in i'm like it it can't be gone it was just right here like there's nowhere to go so i finally had to drag me back into the house because that wasn't even where the the uh stuff was really happening at from the homeowner's uh, point of view. I mean, they hadn't really, we just happened to go check that barn out. Most of the stuff had been happening inside the house. Um, so yeah, that it, it was more disbelief than anything. And, you know, like I said, even catching it and seeing it and other people seeing it, it still, I still had doubt in my head that, okay, maybe I'm just hyped up and maybe my brain's just showing me what I want to see or something. But, you know, I guess it showed the camera what it wanted to see too, because it's there. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. I mean, you, you catch it on video and I'll, I'll, if it's okay with you, I'll link the video in the, uh, on the website of this episode. So that you can see it too, because I mean, when you sent the video, it it stood out to me right away. I mean, I'm looking out this window and I see this figure and it's moving and I'm just like, holy crap. Uh, and, And since it's in the, or you were in the bar when it happened, it's almost like, you know, like whatever has been haunting the house is like, wait, where are these guys going? <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like checking you yeah. out. And, um, I, you know, I'd showed it to a lot of other people and they said, it looks if you, at the very last second before it disappears, it looks female um, for whatever reason. I don't know. You just get that vibe off of it. But that was the report that we had from in the house was um, an older lady, um, uh, her voice and a younger uh, female child's voice. And they had seen the young female child as a shadow person. But when I showed the homeowners that, they said, we have never seen anything that clear. You know, it's usually shadows and just voices. And um, we always, we used to do, um, every time we'd go to a place like that, we would have a person that would do a, like background on the area. Because here in East Tennessee, I mean, not only were there a bunch of Civil War battles fought, I mean, there were skirmishes fought everywhere. You know, this is also one of the homes of the Cherokees. So there, there's burial grounds and everything to the point to where I, I can go out in my backyard right now with a metal detector and pick up, you know, musket balls and stuff just from little skirmishes that happen right on the Tennessee River. I mean, so that's one thing about around here is you may be going to just a house that looks normal, but a couple of hundred years ago, you have no idea what happened on that property before that house was gone. And I think that's what a lot of that stuff around here has to, you know, has to do with. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I've always wanted like I'm really into like hunting for mysteries and you know lost treasures and things like that. I mean, that's really in my wheelhouse of interest. And um, I've never, I've never found anything. I've never even found an arrowhead. You know, I mean, my <laughs> my my mom had a box full of them from when she was a kid, and um, I never, I never found anything like that. And so uh, it, I, I. I I lead I lead a a pretty boring life, but <laughs> I mean the the fact that you you find musket balls in your backyard. I mean, all I got in my backyard is a, fil- a filled in uh, swimming pool that you know left me with a bunch of rocky soil. 
Yeah. I've got a buddy at work that metal detection, like his biggest hobby. And um, he came over where I told you I work at, which is actually just directly behind my house across the river is where my plan is at that we work. And he goes out there and I'm working. He's off work. He's out there looking around. He finds, uh, I don't remember how, it was a bunch of musket balls, but he also found a Confederate belt buckle and a Union belt buckle within like 100 feet of each other, just in a circle. So there was something that went on, you know, like I said, just right over there. And they don't really keep, track of those little skirmishes they do the major battles and stuff like that but you know if if a group of these guys get into it with a group of these guys they don't really have record of that type of stuff but i'm sure it was just where we're located at it was everywhere yeah i can only imagine i can only imagine and you know you're right i mean that that's probably exactly what happened you know it it, you hear about the big battles and stuff like gettysburg you know but uh these guys ran into each other at other times too and you know when they see each other things pop off you know (laughs) literally i mean you know just a few hundred rounds fired at each other that doesn't sound like a lot but when you get out there and start looking for stuff you're like holy crap what the heck went on here and back then it was probably just them i don't know taking pot shots at each other and and it is what it is. I, I don't know. Interesting. Yep. So, uh, all right. So you're you're now a paranormal investigator. You get accepted in this group. They they're probably excited. They have a skeptic on hand so that they can one be more objective in their analysis, but also the uh, the challenge of turning you into a believer. Uh, so where do you go from here? I mean, with your experiences and stuff. I mean, did you uh, go to you know every place and have an experience? I'm assuming that's not the case. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say. I mean, because I know you you mentioned about you know getting EVPs and seeing shadow people and a bunch of other stuff. So where do we go? Uh, yeah, after that, um, we did actually go to quite a few places and nothing happened. I'm not saying that I don't believe the homeowners or whatever, but it just, it just didn't happen. So that was something else to kind of put doubt in my mind. I'm like, okay, if my first thing out here, I see this, I'm, or is somebody messing with me? Cause we've been on like five investigations since I haven't heard or seen anything. And, uh, there's a little town it's in the same County here called Greenback. And we went to this house and they had everything from shadow people to audio, you know, voices and stuff like that and um you know like i said this is about five investigations later um do you remember the, uh, when uh, the prequels for star wars came back out and they made uh, those r2d2 uh, like little tray they would bring like a little tray that you know it's kind of a little gimmick where he'd be like a waiter and you could put batteries in it and he would you know scoot across the ground and bring you drinks and beep boop boop beep and all that stuff yeah. so they had uh we're going through and they're showing us where they've seen and heard everything else. And we walk past this R2 D2 unit and they're like, Oh yeah, by the way, that thing right there will turn on by itself. And we always broke up into pairs, at least pairs, sometimes three in the group. And the guy I was paired with is an ex police officer that had just moved around here. So everyone starts walking up to go to the room and he leans back to me. He says, get the batteries out of that thing right now. He says, I'll cover you. You know, I'll watch for you get the battery. So I go up underneath it and, take the batteries out of it and stick them in my pocket. We don't think anything else about it. Um, we were up in the bedroom doing an EVP session that night. And, uh, we heard some disembodied voices, which we, for whatever reason, we did not catch on recorder, but we both heard them. I went into the closet to open it up and got instant vertigo and almost passed out. He had to bring me out, lay me on the couch. So I'm like, okay, I need, I need some air. And we go get some air. Me and him do. We come back in, we're sitting in the living room doing another EVP session. And all of a sudden this R2D2 unit kicks on. It doesn't move, but it starts beep, 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 you know, doing the R2 sound. And he looked at me and he's like, dude, I told you to take the batteries out. And I, I reached in my pocket. I was like, they're in my pocket. So he's, we run over there to it, flip it up thinking, okay, maybe it's got backup batteries in it or, or something like that. And we're taking this thing had no batteries in it at all. Um, so there you go there's something else that i i can't i can't explain man i mean and this is this is how it progressively got through these things i went from not believing to seeing and hearing stuff that should not should not be possible and that was one of the one of the bigger ones from one of these you know private residential places so that was that was a wild night right there um we uh we told it which we didn't catch it on camera we caught that on audio of it going off and um 
we finally told the homeowners later, yeah, when our on our walkthrough, uh, I took the batteries out of it with you guys without you guys knowing. And I mean, they weren't upset about it, but it was it's just one of those things that I it happened. I have no explanation of how it happened. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So with that experience, I mean, how would a paranormal investigator uh, define that experience then? Knowing the batteries were taken out, it's still powered up. How do you explain that? I mean, do you do you go to it being possessed, or were there electromagnetic energies passed on through an entity, or what? See that that's that's the hard thing to say. I mean, it, it could have been possessed. It could have just been residual energy from something from long ago that said, "Hey, you know, there's wires and circuits in here. Let me just." put whatever energy I have in here to make this thing beep a few times. It could have been poltergeist activity, which um, I don't know about that. That's usually when you have younger, uh, like teenage kids involved and there were no kids like that there. So it's, it's hard to say, man, that's, uh, it's hard to get an answer on any of this stuff. Even, even when you, like I said, when you see it, you record it, you can repeat the experiment, everything, you still don't have an answer for it. So I, I, I do not know. Um, like I said, I had just got done having vertigo at that time. So I was kind of out of it. And it, it's just one of those things that we're just like, well, that happened. Um, on to the next, I guess. I don't know. Um, those people, I, I, didn't, I did notice um, a theme that did start showing up, though, on places um, where activity was happening. One of the biggest recurring themes were they were doing house renovations. Uh, f- I, for whatever reason, you know, I had always heard that and thought, okay, you know, that's just something they say, but no, that became a recurring theme. And these people were doing renovations on their house and all this stuff was kicking up. So, um, I don't know if, see, I even hate to say ghosts because then that implies that there's an afterlife. And if, you know, it's, I don't know, I, that's the whole problem with this situation is I've seen it. I've, I've heard it. I've felt it. I've seen people get attacked by it, but I still don't have any answers for it. And it, it gets frustrating to, uh, to a point. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, no, I, I get it. I mean, as somebody who listens to a lot of people's stories and stuff, uh, there there's oftentimes that they'll say something that I'm just like, I don't even know how to define that. I have no idea, you know? And it's like, you'll often hear me say, well, I don't, I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, that's, that's all you can do is yeah. just throw your hands up and say, well, that happened. Yep. I, I'm not crazy. Other people witness it. I've, you know, recorded it. I don't know what to tell you. Your R2D2 unit likes to work by itself without batteries. Okay, let's take a break and talk about our first sponsor today, which is a new sponsor, Start Mail. You see, I've been really excited about a lot of these sponsors we've been getting focusing on security and safety, and Start Mail is just that. You see, many of you, I'm one of them, has free email accounts, right? Gmail, Yahoo, who doesn't have one of those email providers? I have multiple Gmail accounts I've made over the years, and the problem with these companies is that they're free, and you think that's great. But the problem is it's not free. If you're not paying for it, it's because you're the product. If you don't pay with your money, it's because you're paying with your privacy. And in fact, internet giants like big tech companies bank on exploiting your data by selling it to the highest bidder. Your business plan? Yeah, Google has it. Your medical records? Yahoo sells them to drug companies. That's a fact. You guys know it's a fact. Just because you don't see it happening doesn't mean it's not happening. And we could pretend it doesn't happen and just hope for the best. Or we can be proactive and start utilizing email services that actually care about our privacy. Startmail keeps every email private, period. Every email can be encrypted, even if the recipient doesn't use encryption. Even when you delete your emails, you see a lot of times people are like, oh, I deleted my email. I'm good to go. Not in Gmail. That's still stored. But with Startmail, if you delete it, it's gone forever. And they own their own servers. So unlike Parler, remember guys when Parler got taken off the internet because they were using the Amazon servers and so when Amazon decided to take them down, they were screwed. Not with Startmail. You're safe and secure because they own their own servers and they're in the Netherlands, which is also backed by one of the most stringent privacy laws in the world, which means that they're not under the blanket of what? 
the Patriot Act, which is here in the United States. So you're stepping outside of the Patriot Act when you are taking advantage of start mail. Also, last but not least, I will tell you this. You can do anonymous aliases and you have an unlimited amount that you can use with start mail. So anytime you need a fresh email, you can just boom, it's done with start mail. Right now, start securing your email privacy with start mail. Sign up today and you'll get 50% off your first year. Go to startmail.com slash confessionals. That's startmail with a T, S-T-A-R-T, mail.com slash confessionals for 50% off your first year. Startmail.com slash confessionals. So when people when people bring a paranormal investigation team in, like these private residences and stuff, is it something that they're contacting you to help you, have you help stop the activity or to confirm that they are actually not going crazy? Um, it's a little bit of both. It depends. Um, there was a couple of demonic cases that I was involved. Well, one uh, one the entire group was involved in, but I wasn't there because it got we had a priest and it got really anxious. Those kind of people are trying to get rid of it. Uh, the people like I was talking about with R two D T unit, they were wanting to get rid of it, I guess, but they were more wanting confirmation that that they weren't going crazy. And you know that that's kind of like I said, that's also what kind of stinks when you go to someone's house and and I believe the people wholeheartedly that this stuff is happening, but for whatever reason, when we show up that night, nothing nothing happens. I know that's got to be frustrating for them and. Um, it, it's a little mixture of both. Some people, some people want it to stay. They just want to, you know, document it. They want people to come in with infrared cameras and thermal cameras and catch it so that they have something that when they tell friends or family, they can say, Oh yeah, you don't believe me. Well, check this out. They recorded this, you know? It, so it, it, it's all dependent on the situation. Um, um, like, uh, I don't know. We'll go to, I've been to Waverly Hills sanitarium in, in Louisville, Kentucky, four five six i can't even think five five or six times and i can tell you right now that place is 100 percent one of the most haunted places i've ever been into but the people there obviously you know that's a big place they treat that like a business they don't want that stuff gone they want you to come there you know experience something record something have your own piece of evidence and that kind of stuff and so it's it's just different and it just depends on you know, it's different throughout the people and the locations and all that kind of stuff. Um, so what what were some of the things that you've uh, experienced since you've been to Waverly so many times? I mean, uh, shoot, man, I going there five, six times. I mean, I, I can only imagine that you guys were getting some good activity if you kept going back. Yeah, uh, I think there was another video I sent you of our EMF detector that we had sitting up in a room by itself with just a camera on it. And it wasn't two or three minutes after we walked out that this thing spins. You, it's on camera. It spins around, balances itself on its side, sits there for five or six seconds or so, and falls over. Um, that was one of the better things that we caught on camera. We also, I don't know if you've ever been to Waverly, but the way they had the place set up there, it was kind of like in a V shape, not like a 90 degree deal, you know, it was set up so that the nurses could be set in the middle of the hallway and see down both ends of the hallways in case patients came out of their room. So we would sit in the middle and my brother was actually with me on a couple of these occasions. We would sit in the middle and it would be quiet, no wind or nothing. And I would be looking down one side, he'd be looking down the other and you would just see shadow people darting in between, in between rooms back and forth. And of course, I, I tap on his shoulder and say, dude, did you see that? And as I'm tapping to look over there, I see one down his and he's like, dude, did you see, you know, it, it's back and forth, back and forth. And we go down there and we try to figure out where's the shadow coming from? Well, there is no shadow because there is no light. And um, that's one thing about shadow people. When you, when you see them, it can be in pitch black and you can still see these things. They're somehow blacker than, than pitch black, if that makes any sense. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I started putting a real shadow person in a context. It's like, okay, if it's pitch black here and I can still see movement, it then that, that's something right there. Um, there was also a, uh, it wasn't really a kid's ward. I guess it was one of the rooms that they, the kids 
hung out in and played in or, or whatever. And there were a bunch of balls in there, the other investigators, because what uh, the first time we went up there was just a month or so, or um, a couple of months after the ghost hunters from the ghost hunter show had been there. So we went up there before it was actually open, you know, to the public public on the first occasion, maybe the, even the second occasion it's now open. I mean, you can pay your money and go stay there. Anybody can do it now. Um, but they had these little like beach balls and little bouncy balls in there. And you could sit there and talk and ask these spirits or whatever you want to call them to play with this stuff. And all of a sudden this freaking ball would start rolling across the ground. And I'm like, okay, it's, it's gotta be wind. I'm checking all the windows. Nope. All the windows are intact. They're shut the door. Nothing's coming in. Okay. Maybe it's sitting on an incline. Let's set it somewhere else. It will be sitting there perfectly still for five or 10 minutes. And as soon as you would ask it to move, it was almost like something kicked it, not with enough force to get it off the ground, but kicked it and got it rolling directly towards you. I mean, that's another one of those things that that right there actually creeps me out more than some of the other stuff is when it has to do for whatever reason, when it has to do with little kids, if you hear a little kid's voice, even if it's not menacing in the middle of the night and somewhere like that, it just, it sends chills down my spine, man. I, I would rather, I don't, I would rather see anything than that. You know what I mean? That, that right there just freaks me out for whatever reason, but um let's see what oh they um they had the thing out back it's what they called the death tunnel and they built this because it was a tuberculosis center at one point and um they were having so many deaths that they they built a tunnel out back so they could go straight out the back door and it was underground and it would come out in the parking lot because they didn't want patients to keep you know seeing people dying or rolling out the window it was just not good for patient morale and there's one spot you can get to in this tunnel where you're pitch black. You can't see either side because it's so long and so dark. And we had an EVP session there where we were asking questions and getting direct answers. You know, what's your name? And obviously, I can't remember. It's been years ago, but we we asked what their name was. We would get a name and response. What are you here for? I'm sick. It, you know, you're sitting there basically having a conversation with something. And that's another head scratcher. I mean, what do you make of that? When it's not just like random voices that are coming through your, your audio player. It's you're asking specific questions and getting specific answers. I, I don't, I don't know, man. That's, that's another one of those, those crazy things. Yeah. You know, at, at what point did you become a believer in all this? <clears throat> um, honestly, it was after the, the, um, it was, let's see, we went to the greenback places. It was basically from the, the greenback place. When I told you we went to the house, the home in greenback, Waverly Hills was our next one that we went to. It was a big group. It was a big gathering that we all did once a year. So after, you know, the R2 unit kicks on and stuff and I have the vertigo and all that, then I go to Waverly Hills and all this stuff is happening. Not to mention I'm sitting here having a conversation with something that's when I kind of started being a believer, but I still didn't know what, what to, what to, you know, put a name on it. I, I hate to say the word ghost because like I said, that implies that that's somebody that died. And if that's the case, well, those things should be around everywhere because, you know, billions of people have died over history, but also I'm sitting here asking its name and it's telling me its name and we're having a full fledged conversation. So I would say after that first Waverly Hills uh, visit is when I started to, to say, okay, nobody's messing with me. You know, the, it's not my brain. I've recorded too much. That's when I started to actually, uh, actually believe in this stuff. So you guys are at Waverly Hills. You're having these experiences. Did you go to, when you went to Waverly Hills, did you have an experience every time you went there? Every time I went there, something happened. Every time, um, it was normally just shadow people and EVPs, but, um, like you said, the K2 meter happened. Uh, you, you would always see shadow people, man. And that place is so huge. You go up there with a group of eight or 10 people, you guys can walk around all night in pairs and never see each other. I mean, it's just, it's just huge. Um, so yeah, every time I went to Waverly Hills, um, and, also, when you go in there, like you can come out at any time when they have basically it's like a little 
conference area or whatever where you you where they pay where you pay to go in now you could come out there and you know get in your lunchbox get snacks drinks talk about what's going on every time we would come back some somebody would have something on video or something on audio hey check this out check this out check this out and that's like i said that's just one of those places that i have no doubt in my mind is 100 percent haunted and it never it never let down so yeah it's a place to go if you ever want to check out any of this stuff for yourself for sure so any skeptics out there that don't believe this stuff exists just make a trip to waverly hills and you're saying they'll change their mind i guarantee you that will change their mind absolutely make sure you get away from the group take one other person with you go sit in some random room and just start asking questions start talking just like you're talking to someone that you think you know is there just talk to it and record it all and if something visual doesn't happen, you would definitely get something audio out of that for sure. Do you have to talk? I mean, can you just sit in a, if you're a paranormal investigator, it seems like, I, I mean, uh, I, I wouldn't call myself an investigator of, of really anything. Uh, I'm just a dude that talks to people, but uh, what I see on TV and YouTube and all that stuff, people do these EVP sessions, they get the spirit boxes out, all that stuff. I often wonder can't if the place is really haunted, can you just not just sit down in a dark, quiet room and just sit there and wait for something to happen? Absolutely. You absolutely can. Uh, the story I was telling you about my brother and I sitting there in the middle of the hallway, watching each side of the hallway, we, we sat there for 20 or 30 minutes and did not say a word. And then all of a sudden we're getting shadow people running toward us, running from door to door across the hall. Of course, obviously then we start talking. We're like, oh crap, did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. Did you see this? But no, we sit there for a good, you can go, I mean, you can talk to them. You can go there and sit there. You Sometimes you can walk directly in a room. As soon as you walk into a room, something might fly off the wall at you because something may not want you in there. Um, and like I said, that doesn't necessarily mean that's demonic. That could just be a spirit that's pissed off and doesn't want you there. And, and I mean, it, it can happen multiple different ways. You can sit there for hours and and finally something will happen you can sit there for 10 or 15 minutes asking questions or you can walk directly in a room and something happened before you even get settled so it's all uh it's all different and then it, it doesn't even have to be at night either it, it can happen during the daytime as well oh, of course of course that, that's one thing that i another thing that you know it's you know as somebody who observes a lot of these things you know, the TV stuff or even on YouTube, a lot of times they do stuff at night because it's probably, you know, for the cin cinematic creep factor part, partly because of that. But if a place is really haunted, you know, I don't think there's a, a time of day that the ghosts are like, ah, guys, yo, it's only two o'clock in the afternoon. Let's just wait yeah. a few more hours, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't work like that. Actually, one of the, the best orbs that I ever saw and uh, one of my teammates actually got a picture of it was in broad daylight. This was an orb in a house, broad daylight, illuminating its own light, and it just blinked out. I mean, and I was in the middle of the day. I, you know, not the middle of the day. It wasn't dark yet. It was probably four or five o'clock in the afternoon because we were there get you know getting the rundown and getting set up and all that stuff. But I can't even remember what house that was at. We, I want to say that was one in Knoxville. But uh, yeah, the best the best orb I ever saw was was in the middle of the daytime. Was that the orb that you said you saw something happening on the inside of it? It well, I didn't see it with my when I saw it with my eyes, it just looked like a light. But when the picture was taken, which was a great picture, perfectly in focus, and I wish I could track the lady down that took it. The inside of it looked you know, you know, what are those balls called that you you know you put your hand on it, makes your hair and stuff stand up like that, has all the electricity in the middle of it. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. They you were real popular. Expensive. Yeah, real popular it, back in the day. Yeah, it it kind of looked like that. And it was a lots of different colors and it was just like elect I don't it looked like electrical currents or something running to it or like it's it's hard to explain. And I have tried my best to to get a hold of that lady and um get that photo from her as i was wanting to send that to you as well but um yeah uh, that uh, that's what it looked like it looked just like electricity flowing in the middle of it now like i said with my naked eye it just like just looked like a white light never changed color on me or anything it just kind of got smaller and smaller until it disappeared but the photo she got of it there's there's multiple colors in there it looks like electricity it, 
it looks like one of those little uh, static electricity balls from back in the day. That's what it looked like. Wow. Wow. That's, so, that's interesting. I mean, it almost sounds like the way you're describing it, it sounds like there's, it has its own universe on the inside of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That would be another way to put it. I don't know if you've ever seen that, uh, that photograph that they have of, I guess it's the entire universe basically in one photo Yeah, and you've got lines going from here to here and they're, they're clusters of galaxies and stuff. It's kind of like that, but with the, uh, with an electricity feel to it, if it makes any, I guess what kind of like what uh, they show the neurons firing in your brain and stuff like that. It's, it's kind of the same thing. It's, and now I'm not saying every orb was like that. Just that one that, that we saw in broad daylight and got a great picture of that's, that's how it looked like there was a lot of stuff going on on the inside of it. Very interesting. Very interesting. I, I don't think I've ever heard that before about the orbs and stuff. I'd be interested to hear if other people have had similar experiences where, you know, they caught a picture, a really good picture of an orb and they could actually see some kind of activity going on, on the inside. Yep. And that, that was, that wasn't a video. That was a still picture with a really good camera that she had. And she just, I guess, happened to set it up perfect and time it at the right time because it was a great picture it was uh our website is actually i guess they i don't know if they changed it or what i haven't talked to these guys in years but it was on our website on our homepage at one point but the website's been either changed or taken down or it took me uh, close to a month just to track down my videos that were you know my personal videos so i had to make phone calls and all that stuff but but yeah, that that was a that was a great a great picture. I'd actually forgot about that until you'd mentioned that to me. But I guess I mentioned that in one of the emails or something. But, well, actually, uh, I, I can read minds, and so no, oh, okay. I got you. <laughs> yeah, that's why you want me to put these headphones on. You want to go yeah. straight. Yeah, I, I wanted okay. <laughs> I wanted more of a connection. Yep, that's exactly it. Uh, so to backtrack just a little bit. You're and I, I'm of the this opinion, but it sounds like you are as well. Where you, if a place is actually haunted, all I could do, all I have to do is sit down in a room and just hang out and chill, and something could happen. You know, it, I don't need to try to summon something in order for it to happen. Absolutely not. No, not in my experience, anyways. No, doing that kind of stuff may help speed the process up, but you can go in there, like I said, and just sit. Hopefully, if you or any of your listeners go to Waverly Hills, hopefully, as soon as you walk through the door, something will yell at you or something, <laughs> or something happen. You know, like I said, that that could happen. Um, I, I do have a lot a more experience with actually just having a conversation, but that's like I said, that's not always the case. You can just go sit in the dark room and and wait, especially after a few minutes when your eyes adjust to the dark and you can see other, you know, see more of the room. That's uh, that's a good, that's a good way to do it. You know, and a lot of people actually prefer it to do, prefer to do it that way instead of talking or whatever. <laughs> really? I wouldn't have guessed that because every, everybody I watch on, on TV and stuff, they're all about, you know, who's here. Tell me your name. I'm angry. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I've got a, I can tell you a story here in a minute about why you should not do that. But, um, no, there were certain people in our group that, their their way of you know we all had our own little ways of doing things um a lot of times me and will the guy that was a police officer we would try provoking after you know so many minutes and so but some people i said they would just go in there and sit and be quiet and, and if it was a small place you'd walk in and say oh my gosh there's a ghost oh no wait that's just docs over there in the <laughs> sitting over there in the corner <laughs> being quiet <laughs> but yeah um I can I can tell you about the uh, the yelling at them and uh, provoking them. This Please. was actually one of the scarier things that happened. Uh, I started. My brother got interested in this because he went to, he went to Waverly with me once, and like I said, we saw that he wound up going back with me again. Um, there's a, a place down here right past Chattanooga, Tennessee, called uh, South Pittsburgh Hospital. It's uh, it's closed down now, uh, but you you know you can go there and and know that you stay overnight if you have a group and, and do paranormal investigations there and it was uh me my buddy will i was telling you about my brother and one of will's friends so there's just four of us in this entire hospital and we honestly weren't having a lot of activity and we had set up our i guess you want to call it base camp up on the third floor where the uh, receptionist would be at you know right there in the middle where the nurses and everything are and uh, there's a chapel down the hallway and I had 
I actually started to get irritated because this is the second or third time I had been there and I'm trying to show my brother other stuff and nothing's happening. So on the, on the wall, there was actually still some lab coats hanging up on the wall from when this place was open. So we decided to go down to the, to the chapel and uh, Will is going to stand up and uh, basically just, just talk and stand up at the altar, but you know, not pray or nothing like that. Just, just talk to what's going on. And um, I'm sitting, we're all spread out through the chapel or it's kind of a small chapel, but we're all spread out through it. And I've got this lab coat on and I get irritated and just start yelling as if I'm a nurse, you know, telling them they need to get back in bed. You know, you're not coming out to play. You need to go back to bed, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden my brother stands up and he said, Trey, my shoulder's burning. And I'm like, what do you mean it's burning? You know, so we stop what we're doing and we run over there. <laughs> And it's on the back of his shoulder, so he can't see it. And we, he lifts his shirt up. And I've got photos of this as well. And Will and I come over there, and, he's, and my brother's like, what, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? And, dude, you could see welts coming up on the back of his shoulder, like claw marks. You could see them rising where something had just scratched him. And Will and I look at each other. We don't want to tell him what happened to freak him out. But he's like, man, it's burning, it's burning, it's burning. So, um you know, we just kind of tell him, you know, calm down, be easy. We got out of there. We went back and I got back to the receptionist area. And I'm thinking, great, I've just provoked something into attacking my brother. This is not good. <laughs> um, we did get activity, I guess. Um, we finally took pictures of it and showed him. And it it kind of freaked him out a little bit. Um, and see, I had always told him up to that date that we don't, uh, I didn't want to prove, I don't ever want to provoke these things because, it's not something that you can punch back. You know what I mean? It's if they want to do something, they want to throw something at you or scratch you like he got scratched, what are you going to do? But you're not going to do anything. But it had come to a point in the night where it was almost time for us to, to you know, start packing stuff up because it was going to be daylight. And we started smack talking. And I guess we got what, what we deserved and what we were looking for because he got scratched. But the way he got scratched, like I said, when we went over there, his shoulder was just red. But as we were shining the light on it, you could actively see the welts start coming up on it. It's, um, and there was only three of them, which was weird. There wasn't like a, f- a whole full hand or four fingers. There was three of them. But but yeah, we, ha- we got photos of that too. So that's one reason I would say not to provoke these things and, and unless you're ready for something bad that could happen I'm not saying it will but it could happen friends we talk about security on this show we talk about home security food security survival security and now we're talking about online security with surfshark vpn they keep your online identity safe by encrypting all the information sent between your device and and the internet. This keeps your personal data protected from big companies or cyber criminals. Surfshark has 3,200 servers in 65 countries. You can access and unblock content libraries and streaming services from other countries like all of the Netflix libraries. And here's the most important part, friends. This is the thing that I love and I know you guys love too because most of the people that listen to this show are kind of in the similar thought process as me. You can bypass censorship everywhere. Surfshark liberates your internet by unblocking blocked websites and bypassing geo restrictions. That's a huge thing for me. And I know it's a huge thing for a lot of people, especially people who are trying to, you know, research things and understand what's happening around the globe. Sometimes you need to be able to unblock certain websites that are blocked where you're located at. Now you can secure your online data as well. A VPN encrypts your online data and helps to secure your personal information when you use free public Wi-Fi, and that is a goldmine for hackers. They look for things like that. So you're going to protect yourself like that. Masking your IP address is essential to becoming private online. A VPN makes sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked to your identity. Friends, having a VPN is huge, and Surfshark is huge as well, and that's why I'm really glad they're here. Be sure to go to surfshark.deals confessionals and use my code confessionals to get... 83% off plus three extra months for free. That's a great deal, friends. 83% off plus three free months when you go to surfshark.deals slash confessionals and use my code confessionals.
So the three scratches, I mean, that's something that a lot of people talk about happening and stuff. I mean, how do you as a paranormal investigator um, view the whole three scratch thing? I don't know. I've seen three scratch. I've seen four, you know, like four nails. Uh, I've seen um, just one, like, like, like a, with a finger. I, I've, I've seen just about every spectrum on it, except for five. I've never seen somebody get scratched to have like four fingers and a thumb. I've never seen that. Not to say that it doesn't happen, but I've never seen it. Um, I, I, I don't know, man. I, like I said, this this is one of the reasons I got out of this stuff because after close to ten years of doing this stuff, I just kind of said, "Well, I, I don't have any answers. I've got all the evidence in the world, but I have no answers." It's just every time I get something, it just makes me ask more questions, and it um, it's about to make my head explode. So that I, I don't I don't have an answer for that for you. Was your brother involved in paranormal investigating before you? Because I mean, you weren't a believer, then you get involved. I mean, did you did he get involved because of you? He got yeah, he got involved because he did not believe either. And he knew that I didn't believe to start with. And then I start bringing him on these videos and letting him hear these EVPs and stuff. And he's like, you know, I want to go on one. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know, man. And then finally, the the yearly Waverly Hills come around. I believe that was the first time. Yeah, it was the first time he went. The Waverly Hills trip come, and I asked the people. I said, "Yo, my my brother is very interested. Can he come?" And that was the night that we sat and watched shadow people for twenty or thirty minutes, just run up and down the hallways. So yeah, he, he got into it because of me. He did not believe either at start. He was even questioning some of the videos and and audio and stuff I was bringing back, but um. It didn't take him long, especially going to Waverly Hills for your first time. It it won't take you very long to uh to say there's something here. Was he scared during those times? Uh he wasn't scared at Waverly Hills. He was having a blast, you know, he was hanging out with Big Brother and seeing this stuff. But when when we were at the other the hospital here in Tennessee and he got scratched, he was trying to to hold it off like he wasn't, but I could tell in his eyes that he was freaked out. Um he was he was ready to go like i said luckily we we were just like an hour or so away from from being let out of there so we could go and uh daylight coming up and all that good stuff so we didn't have to stay very much longer but yeah he uh he wasn't really freaked out at waverly but he was definitely i could see it in his eyes he was freaked out at, at the hospital for sure yeah well I, I can imagine i mean if somebody gets scratched by an entity i mean i, I imagine that's pretty freaky no matter who you are uh now what are some of these demonic encounters you referenced and stuff? I mean, uh, have you ever like, is it like you've, you spoke to a demonic entity or they've appeared or what? Okay. So there was only while I was there, there was only two that I was involved in. And one of them, I was not even present. They took the priest. They took the, the two founders of our group and they took one lady, which I, I guess I could get into that one first because I did get to hear the audio and heard the eyewitness accounts from that. The, there was some, uh, I can't remember how old she was, teenage girl that re- was exhibiting possession signs. And this is, you know, this is into the point where I'm in this where I'm like, okay, I've seen this and that, but I've never seen anybody. I've watched The Exorcist. Is that what you're talking about? It's, it's just like the girl from The Exorcist. And they're like, yeah, basically that's it. So apparently when that happened, the priest had his Bible, had a wooden uh, crucifix. This is just one of the things that happened. And while he was saying whatever prayer he was saying, the crucifix snapped in half in his hand. It was a wooden crucifix. It snapped in half. Once that happened, they swung the camera over toward him. You you don't actually see the, the crucifix break on camera. They swing the camera over and you can see it broke in his hand and then the picture flies off the wall. and. On the audio, you can hear this teenage girl start with this god awful, god awful laugh. It it's it's something that you really don't, unless you're ready, you really don't want to hear that. That's one of the most disturbing things that, that you'll ever hear of her laughing and talking. And she was also speaking in a language that she didn't know. I'm not sure what what language it is because I have trouble with. <laughs> recognize and even some spanish but um yeah that was a bad situation I, I do know that it eventually turned out to be okay and she was fine um months later but after that first interaction between the priest and the, the few investigators that were there they kind of locked all that stuff off to the rest of the members and took care of that um 
with other members of the clergy and and stuff like that. So uh, the one that I was actually involved with, um, this was this lady that was living alone. Uh, she was a very religious lady, um, but she had just got a divorce from her husband. Her husband had done a lot of bad things, including, uh, I think, physically assaulting her and stuff like that. But uh, we went up there. I was the only male, <clears throat> excuse me, I was the only male there, you know, this lady that owns the place and three female investigators and me. And th the main stuff was happening in her bedroom. She was hearing growls and and just whispers and stuff like that. Now, every time I would walk in the room, Tony, nothing. It's like everything went back to normal for whatever reason. I don't know if it was because I was the only guy there or what. But when I would walk in there, everything would stop. But they had audio recorders and video recorders set up through the whole room. And on multiple occasions, as soon as I walked out the room, you would hear this crazy growl that sounded like like my 100-pound pit bull was about to attack something. I mean, it sounded it sounded bad again. And nowhere as near as bad as, as the girl laughing. But it was no doubt about it, a growl. And they would say, Trey, 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 come back. I'd walk back in there. Everything would go back to normal. So... That that happened on that. Um, another thing that happened is I decided, you know, there's two or three female investigators in there with this lady. And, and OK, every time I go in there, it's just leaving. So the, there's no way I can do anything. Well, there's nothing I can do about it anyways. But I decided to walk through the house and just kind of check out the rest of the house. And I have this on video as well of me walking through a house and with the camera not saying a word and i don't know how i got there but the next thing i know i'm up on the opposite side of her house on the third floor in the bonus room just kind of staring at the wall and it's there on, it's it's there with me on video walking you know walking through the house going directly up to the spot and i kind of come to and i'm staring at the wall and there's i mean i'm just a couple of feet from it, it wasn't like i was looking for anything I kind of shake the head and shake the camera. And I'm like, dude, I've not even been in this room. Where the heck am I? All right. So when you're on video, you're, you're filming this whole thing. Wait, were you saying anything while you're on the way to that room? Was not saying a word. I did not. Um, like we would do on a normal walkthrough of a house, you know, kind of peek your head into this room, walk down the hall, peek your head in this room. I went straight up the steps all the way to the top all the way down the hall, didn't stop, didn't say a word and kind of came to when I was standing over there next to the wall. And that kind of freaked me out because like I said, the last thing I had remembered was telling the girls, okay, I'm going to go do a walk around and check out other things. And I don't remember walking up there, but it's on camera of, you know, me, it's not on camera. It's me holding the camera as I'm walking. How not saying a word or nothing. How long did you stand facing the wall until you came through? It was as soon as uh, when the cameras on there is basically as soon as I got there and stopped um, is when I came to because you can see the camera and me kind of shake a little bit like, oh, crap. And then I'm starting to turn around in circles like, where am I at? I've not been to this room yet. And then me trying to trying to find my way back downstairs because I hadn't been up upstairs yet. I mean, you know, I, so it was pretty instant um, once I got up there. But that's so yeah, I don't know if that was trying to get me as far away as from where they were so something could happen they did get growled at while i was gone but that was kind of a thing that just kept happening all the time every time i would leave so but i i honestly kind of think that's what the whole i don't know that that was the purpose or if that's what happened but it was it just felt like it was it seems to me like it was trying to get me as far away from from what was happening as, as possible but like I said, I have no memory of walking up those steps and walking into that room. So would you classify that as a possession? Uh, I, I wouldn't think so. Um, no, I did not. I did not change any. I mean, I didn't change any behaviors or nothing like that. Uh, possessions, a, a, it's a hard thing to. I, I, would, I myself would not classify it as possession. No, I would just say something wanted me to to go the opposite direction and i did and i wasn't harmed i wasn't you know speaking in different languages i just, just don't have any memory of walking up there basically that's it i don't and know man that's crazy there, 
That's it, yeah, as soon as I got there, it kicked out. And I, I don't know, maybe some people would classify this possession, but I did not. I didn't feel any different after that. I mean, I was kind of freaked out for where I was at, but feeling different or anything so I, I don't i don't know you could call it what you want i mean it could be but it didn't feel like it to me all right so you don't you don't classify it as a possession where you know you're, you're vomiting green vomit and your your head's turning around in circles and stuff but i mean they're, they're they're the way you're describing it to me it sounds like there was an entity that didn't want you around and it led you to this room but if you don't remember it and it just kind of happened, I mean, it had to have some kind of control over you in some way, right? It, it, see, it's hard to tell because I don't, I don't remember, I don't remember any of that. Uh, it, I guess you could say that is possible, yeah. But I never had any long term effects from it. Um, it as soon as basically got like as soon as I got to the end end of the room which is on the other side of the house i snapped directly out of it i knew exactly what had happened well not exactly what happened i knew where i was not i was where i was not supposed to be at and don't remember getting there so i I guess it just depends on how you look at it yes that that could be i've never thought of it that way in my life but some other people may look at it and say yeah that's that I, I find it really interesting because one of my uh passive uh things i do when i just need a break from you know editing audio or something i hop on youtube and i watch these guys do ghost hunting uh videos because i I just i find it fascinating it's really interesting and sometimes i see you know there's this like the the one the one time i was watching these guys and and they were investigating this house and the one guy has something happen and he gets freaked out he's calling for his friend he can't find his friend anywhere he's gone and he's like, where is, and he's walking around and stuff. And he goes out to the shed outside and his friends inside the shed facing the corner. And he's like, yo, and, 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 and like the kid, the, the, the guy just like kind of snaps out of it at that time. But he's like, he had no recollection of any like time that had passed. He, he thought that they had to go into the house still to do the investigation. And he's like, we, I, we were just in the house, man. Like it was yeah. weird. Yeah. That, I mean, that kind of sounds like what happened to me, except for, I didn't have any, like, I didn't realize that we hadn't started the investigation. Obviously I knew that the ladies were downstairs in the bedroom. I knew what was going on, but it's all, and, and almost, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember this loosely, but it, cause it was years and years ago, but it almost felt to me like when, when you're driving down the interstate or road that you drive all the time and you're just kind of driving and sooner or later, your three or four exits pass. You're like, Holy crap. I, I don't even remember, you know, driving this little, portion you know what i mean but the only thing that kind of throws that off is i guess i had never been that's first time i'd been to that house that was also the first time i had been upstairs first time i'd been in that room but that that's kind of what i remember about it is it just seemed like one of those things like well i guess i just walked up here and didn't really pay attention to anything but then i start dissecting and i'm like no that goes against all of the training i would have went through you know if i'm going to a new floor of a house that has activity in it i'm not going to walk down the hall and up the stairs past seven or eight rooms and not even stick my head into one of them when i've got free reign of the house and go to one particular spot so i don't i don't, I don't know about that that's um now you're kind of freaking me out i hope it wasn't <laughs> i'm not trying to freak you out it's just <laughs> like you know if to me from the way you described it to me the way i'm hearing it is that you know you, you don't you have missing time and you wind up going into this room, you're staring at a wall. And for me, I have the imagery of the previous videos that I've seen. Uh, and I, to be honest with you, I was just watching the one yesterday. So it was fresh in my mind. And I was just like, holy crap. Because I, I, I'm watching the video. I'm thinking to myself, are these guys yanking my leg? I mean, come on, really? And then you, you're you coming on and telling me that, yeah, that happened to you. <laughs> it did. Yeah. It, that, that's the only time. Well, I shouldn't say that. That's the only time I can remember it happening. And the reason I remember it happening is because I had my camera in my hand, which was recording. That's, you know, not to say that it hadn't happened before when I didn't have a camera, I guess. But I just happened to have a video of that. And I I don't know. Man, that's interesting. I find that so interesting. Uh, Wow. So, all right. We talked about Waverly Hills. And how you investigated there, you had the shadow figures. Your brother got scratched at Waverly Hills, right? 
No, he got scratched at uh, South Pittsburgh Hospital here in That's Tennessee. That's what it was. That's what it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so um, we talked about these different locations, but you came into my neck of the woods. So, you, I mean, you've done investigations in uh, Philadelphia, Tennessee, but you've also come to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to do the Eastern State Penitentiary, which, you know, I'm familiar with. I've been there myself. Uh, what kind of things have happened there? Um, honestly, it, it was a great place to visit. Um, we did have one. Well, that's not true. We saw a few shadow people, but we did have one thing that happened, which uh, the Chattanooga Paranormal team that that I went with, I believe they have it on their YouTube still. Um, you'll see a lot of um, a lot of investigators, especially on TV, they'll get these flashlights and they'll turn it to where it's just barely not on. You know what I mean? So they're like any small connection will turn the light on and they'll sit there and ask questions, turn you know, blink once for yes, twice for no. Um, we didn't want to do that. We used a push button flashlight that you actually had to press the button into to turn this thing on. And we were sitting at what was one of the release points where the few people that got to leave that place, because that place was a horrible place to be in jail. Um, it was basically where, you, you know, you could go through there and then you were on your way out. And it was all, once again, it was toward the end of the evening and the guys from uh, Chattanooga Paranormal were basically antagonizing and saying, OK, if, if you can turn this flashlight on for us, we will let you walk out of here right now. And we just kept saying it and they were, you know, giving it a countdown. They're like, all right, you've got so many minutes left. We're leaving. And with just a few minutes left of antagonizing, this flashlight clicks on. And like I said, it's not one of those that they've loosened up real loose and it could short out. No, this was one that you had to actually push the button in and turn on. Um, that was pretty freaky. Um, the bad thing about Eastern State, though, is it's so old and stuff is falling. Like stuff would fall from the ceilings and it would sound like footsteps because when stuff would fall, it wouldn't just be one tiny piece of paint that would fall. There'd be, if one thing fell, there'd be three or four things fall. So you would hear what sounded like footsteps there for the first couple hours. We were like, Holy crap, there's stuff all over the place. And then when my buddies had a piece of paint from the roof fall off and hit him on the head and we're like, okay, well, there goes all that. <laughs> but, um, the flashlight thing, I so said, I've got it wrote down here. Um, if you go to Chattanooga paranormal Eastern state flashlight, on youtube you can see that video um you can only hear me in the background i said holy crap the flashlight just turned on and obviously they they open the door and they're like okay you're free to go now but um that was that was the biggest thing that happened there um, we did see a few shadow people but like i said the, the building being so old all of our audio was was basically was basically ruined because like i said every Every few minutes, you'd hear something fall from the ceiling. And plus, it was wet in there. So sometimes stuff would fall, land in water, which would give it a different sound. And um, it was it was a, you know, a great place to go visit and all that. We just, it, it wasn't as active as, say, Waverly Hills or anything like that. Yeah. And that, that's the that's the exact thing that I've gotten when I went there as well. Like, I just didn't feel like there was much activity there. Now, granted, I was there during the day and people say, I go at night, but I, I just don't think that I have to go at night in order for things to happen. Uh, and so it, it's, it was one of those things where it was kind of like, a for me, it was like a letdown. I was like, oh man, I'm going to this legendary place. And then like nothing. I was just like, oh, well. Yeah. When they open the gates to that place, you're like, oh my God, if anywhere in the world is haunted, this place right here is haunted. Because especially where it sits, I, I know you're familiar with the area. It sits kind of in like a, a part of town where there's restaurants like directly across the street. And that, bars it's and in stuff. the hood. It's in the yeah. hood. <laughs> it's like a dang right in the middle of it, it's like this huge castle looking thing and it's just it's so old and decrepit looking but it's right there in the middle of like all this other stuff going on and like i said as soon as they open the gates and let you in my first thought was oh my god this this has definitely got some stuff going on but yeah they you know? They um when they first built that prison, it was on the outside of the city. I think they said it was like two miles outside the city. And then the city grew and grew and grew to the point that residential neighborhoods built up around the prison and it was still being active, I think what, in the nineteen seventies or something. And yeah, it was 
pretty late, pretty late. Yeah. yeah. It, it got to the point where, you know, people were in a neighborhood throwing drugs over the walls to prisoners. And uh, there was a, I think a kindergarten center right across the street from the prison and all this stuff. It's like, Hey, maybe yeah. we should shut this down now. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Al Capone was there at one time. Yeah. I don't remember. Do you remember seeing his cell? They yep. had like knocked a wall out and made two cells for him. And he had like a couch and, a, a not a radio, but, a uh, like a stonograph, whatever the crap, like he had a, a suite basically in this place. And, um, but their whole, their whole idea back then from what I remember the tour guide telling us, at least when it first started was <clears throat> these prisoners were sent to their room. You know, they had a, a like a, a light in the ceiling or you know, like a place in the ceiling for sunlight to come in and they were to pray. Like, I don't remember how many hours that's what they're supposed to do is pray until they were forgiven, which, you know, they could be forgiven by God, obviously, but the prison guards are not going to forgive them and let them out. So their whole life, the rest of their life, they were stuck in that little room, just staring at this little hole in the ceiling, praying. Yeah, I think I think the prison originally was uh, made and created by the Quakers, if I remember correctly. Isn't that true? Yeah, I believe that's right. The Quakers. Yep. And I think even when they went outside that like they would just open up part, the back part of their cell and they had like a little six by six, you know, fenced in area where they could go out back so that was their outside time was smaller than the room they were in the room was just barely big enough to fit a bed in and it was a pretty pretty brutal place but uh but yeah as far as have activity I, it it was kind of a letdown especially me having you know flying from all the way down here and planning a whole couple of weekend or a weekend after all this stuff and it, it just it was a kind of a letdown but it is a really cool place i mean historically yeah i agree i agree and i like i said earlier and stuff i absolutely love history i i, I mean don't get me wrong easter state penitentiary it, very historical i love it but for me it's the the lost history the lost history the mysterious lost history you know that i that i really kind of mm, i freaking love right. that stuff yep. uh so you know Eastern State's been really, you know, investigated a lot and, you know, it, they, they do tours and, you know, it's a big business now. Uh, so I, I like the more off the beaten path kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's what I was telling you before we started, man, um, with the exception of Waverly Hills, most of the big stuff that I've had happen has been at private, private residences. Like it's not at some, you don't have to go to some abandoned hospital or something like that because like i said especially around here man you never know what these houses what was like for my house example you never know what was here before this house was built you, you have no idea i mean it's those are some of the best places to go but in my opinion anyways yeah I agree, man. I agree. So listen, before we wrap things up, though, I, I, I know we were setting out to talk about this per se, but I, I just got to ask you, man. So the way you got out of pa being a paranormal investigator was you had a Bigfoot experience and you concluded that it would be easier to find answers about Bigfoot than it was the paranormal. So what was this experience that kind of made you shift your whole investigative uh, field? All right. Well, I actually, I had two. The first one I had was in 2011 or 12. I cannot remember the year I've tried. Um, my buddies and I, when we were in high school, man, we always used to go camping on Friday nights. Everyone would go to football games, but no, we wanted, we would go camping because my buddy had a dairy, his dad had a dairy farm. So we had like 2000 acres. You know, we'd sneak a few beers out there and, and go camping or whatever. So we decided to get back together. Like I said, it's like 2011 or 12 and uh, go out here to uh, Cherokee National Forest and uh, camping. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, one, one of the things we used to do when we were younger is we would uh, see if we could get the coyotes going first because we used to make them, you know, start yipping and hollering back. And it was just kind of fun. And we decided to do that again. And we did. We got the coyotes going, which was cool. It's like, oh man, I remember doing this. And about the time that they started going off, we heard the loudest. I can't even explain to you what this scream was like. It was like a woman being brutally murdered, and it was far away. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it was so loud. Everything shut up. And the, the coyotes shut up. Me and my buddy stopped laughing. The, uh, the lights, the camp next to us came. Like it was. 
freaky, but I did not know that much about Sasquatch at that time. I knew, you know, I had seen the Patterson Gimlin film on, on and stuff like that, but I didn't really know a whole lot about that. I just knew this, when that happened, I went out to my Jeep and I got my gun. I was like, I'm, I don't know what that was, but I'm sleeping with my gun tonight. <laughs> so, um, I guess it, that was right about the same time that Wes started his show. And I just happened to find it. <clears throat> Sasquatch Chronicles. I found it and uh, started listening to it and had heard the intro back then. It has some of the screens in there. So I got real into that. And um, one of his co-hosts at the time, I'm not going to mention his name, this asked me, told me that I should put up flyers to see, you know, if anybody else could see anything or heard anything around that area. And it took a little while, you know, five, six months, but I, I started getting emails from eyewitnesses. Um, most of them had had uh, roadside crossings right in the same area. They had heard screams and stuff. And I thought, you know, this is what it's got. You know, this is what I had to hear that night. So um, I had one uh, older gentleman contact me and this was a few years back um it was right around halloween and i'll tell you why i know exactly why it was around halloween he was uh fishing right there you can you know just put you some waders on get there and it's good for trout fishing that type of stuff and he saw one of these things come down to this creek and start drinking water now he thought at the time what he told me he said it was, you know, it was right at Halloween. Like I said, he thought it was somebody in a monkey costume and he starts just cursing this thing out and yelling at it and all this stuff. And he said, when it stood up, he knew instantly as soon as this thing stood up that it wasn't a person because it was so big. Um, I don't have those notes in front of me, but I know it was over eight feet. I want to say eight and a half feet of black. Um, but like I said, when it was sitting down drinking water, he thought it was just somebody messing with him and being Halloween. And uh, like I said, on you, you know, you don't mess with an old man that's fishing or, or hunting around here or, or you'll get the business. But he told me about that. And he said he was shocked when it stood up. And that was kind of drew me back to that area. And the ghost hunting stuff was starting to taper off because it was like, well, if I want to keep doing this, first of all, I've, I've got everything on camera. I've got all this audio, but I've got more questions than, than I started out with. I don't have any answers. I'm not going to find any answers. It's just not going to happen. I was like, well, maybe I'll, I'll start checking this out. Um, so that's why I put those flyers up and talked to that old man. And um, <clears throat> it was, uh, I don't know, a few months later, um, I went back to real close to the area where he saw that at. And I'm, I didn't have hip high waders on. I just had waders that came up to my knees and I'd parked a little far down from him. And I was trying to figure out a way to cross that Creek because across that Creek, there's a mountain that goes straight up and it just goes back for miles. There's nothing there. I wanted to get on top of that mountain and see, you know, what was back there. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going down through there, trying to find a place to, to uh, cross and I hear a snap like a, it's honestly it sounded like a gunshot and i thought well you know there's nothing over there maybe that was a gunshot because there's nothing in those woods <clears throat> I keep going a little farther and i'm, I'm testing out the water in a place <clears throat> to see if i can cross without getting wet and i hear another pop and it's almost at the same time i'm looking up i hear a pop and i see the back of an arm reach up and grab a tree and pull up the left uh, I'm guessing it's his left leg. Never saw foot, never saw hand, never saw face. So I can't say this for 100% certain, but I saw an upper extremity, grab a tree, pull up a lower extremity, and then it go up the hill. <clears throat> I kind of thought maybe it was a bear because we do have bears here, but this was an orangish reddish color. And it also outstretched its arm to to pull itself up. So I was like, okay, screw this. I don't care if this water's deep or not. I'm I'm going across the creek. Just go across the creek. I'm trying to not, you know, break my ankles on the rocks and stuff. And I get up there and I get, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 feet up there and I'm laying on my side. Matter of fact, my pistol's digging into my leg because it, it's vertical straight up. And I'm laying on my side thinking, dude, what are you doing? You're chasing after, like, even if it's just a pair, why are you chasing after this? You know, reality starts kicking in. Why, oh, what the crap I'm doing chasing this thing? So I'm sitting there for a minute and I'm thinking, 
okay, this thing's got to be close because this thing is, you know, it's a straight up hill. I'm going to sit here and see if I can hear anything. And, and Tony, I didn't hear, I didn't hear a word. I didn't hear, I didn't hear nothing. The only sound I heard was the, the water, the rocks from the water down below. And so this thing had, this thing was moving up the hill and, you know, I've ran into bears quite a bit. When, when they run from you, they, they can't help themselves. They break down, destroy everything in their path, trying to get away from people. Um, they're scared of them, but this thing, the only sounds it made were a few pops that I heard. And then when it, took off the hill and i took off across the creek i never heard another sound from it no that doesn't mean that it didn't just get up there and sit somewhere where i couldn't see it because it was vertical or maybe it got away it, it was moving a heck of a lot faster than i was so that's my little uh my little encounter there and like i said i can't say for 100 percent, but it was something on two legs that pulled itself up with a tree um I did go back down and wind up looking to that tree that it grabbed and it had ripped some of the bark off where it grabbed it, but it didn't uproot the tree. And, you know, bears, if they get around a tree, that's the only reason they would grab one is to, is to knock it over and get the, the grubs and stuff underneath it. But so this thing was using like a stepping, stepping stick to get up the hill. So, so yeah, after sitting there for about 10 minutes, I thought, God, I'm an idiot. I'm, I'm sitting here with a, a nine millimeter on my hip. This could be a, eight foot, <laughs> you know, Sasquatch. What am I doing? And yeah. I got back in and left, but yeah, that was my, uh, I still, uh, I still do, you know, take reports and go out and meet people. And, uh, my nephew's, <laughs> my nephew is fascinated by the subject. Um, he was so excited. He actually got to do the intro the other day on one of the shows, but, um, yeah, you know, take him out hiking and camping, but, um, for whatever reason, the past year or so, the, the the reports that I've been getting have died down a lot. When I first started getting them four, uh, three or four years ago, I mean, I was just getting one after another after another. Sometimes I'd go out and meet two people on the same day in the same area. But for like in the last year or so, that is, I don't know if it's something to do with the weather and maybe they've taken a double, you know, another route or something. But I just haven't had that many here lately. <laughs> but so. But yeah, like I said, after all the, the paranormal stuff and you have all this stuff happen and all I can do at the end of the day and just, like I said, throw my hands up and say, well, that happened. I yeah. don't know how to explain it, but it happened. I figured, you know, I've had these kind of small experiences and some people telling me about, about Bigfoot. It's a helmet. You know, it's got a rich area around here. Uh, Bigfoot does anyways in the East Tennessee mountains. There's a lot of, a lot of wilderness here. I figured, heck probably be easier to, to check this out and see if i could find any answers but kind of stuck in the same boat on that now because the same way you get in there and every time you think you know something something else comes up and uh, it's, it's frustrating but so yeah that, that was my, my little venture from from paranormal to to bigfoot that's interesting man yeah i i i just had a dog man sighting in in the town that i live in last year and the report just came out not too long ago like I think it was this week or last week. And um, I sent it to some friends and stuff. And my one friend was like, well, I got nine, my nine. And I was just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Good luck with that, my friend. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I started taking it, which it's not going to matter. But I, I started taking my 12 gauge with me when I would go. I'm like, all right, if this thing coming after me at least i could put a slug in its eyeball or something but yeah that that's my exact thought when i was laying on the side of the hill I'm like what are you doing dude you've got bear spray which is going to make you taste a little better and you've got a nine millimeter glock <laughs> you are screwed and the heat this the hill was so steep i if i would have ran up i would have been running into it if i went down i would have face planted into the freaking river like i, I wasn't going anywhere so it was just, just one of those, I don't know, I just got overexcited and, and took off doing something stupid that I should have never done, but I, I couldn't I couldn't hold back. <laughs> but you know, I learned my lesson there. Yeah. I I got I got a, a shotgun that will put a hole in your shoulder when you shoot it. And so, you know, I'm like, maybe I'll start start taking that out with me. <laughs> Some bigger yeah, so, better than a nine millimeter right? yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i had i had to jump through hoops to get this thing too i mean it took me eight months to get it because um well i'm not gonna get into wow. it but yeah it, it's it's legit <laughs> and so, um but uh trey man i appreciate you coming on the show and you know you mentioned about you know i think you said your nephew or something uh with recording do you have your own show 
No, no, no. This was on uh, West on West in, uh, Sasquatch you. Chronicles. Uh, you know how yeah, he does yeah, a little yeah, intro yeah, yeah. or whatever. He, yeah, he uh, he got to say, "Hey, this is Casein from East Tennessee, and you're listening to." You know, he just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. He's uh, his dad called me and said he's bouncing off the walls, calling all his friends, <laughs> telling him he's famous now. <laughs> like, oh, great. Yeah, um, he. We just took him camping actually a couple of weeks ago. His first camping trip of of the year. So he's he's wet, he's real into that. He's into survival. He likes to try to start the fire with just a flint steel and all that stuff. So he's uh he's gonna be a little little outdoors when he grows up. That's for sure. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. I don't care where or how you share the show. Just share the show if you enjoyed it. That's the best thing you can do to help this show grow is to share with your friends. So thank you very much, friends, for being here. Thanks for listening on a continued basis. And until next week, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Bye. Awakened from the forest in the depths of the abyss, this creature is a paradigm of time lost and time itself. It fears no one. It adheres to no rule that man can create. It forges its own path, and yet its path remains hidden from the world. The sphere of its existence is beyond most comprehension as it exudes its power quietly but transcendent. It needs no one's approval to exist, but yet its very existence is sought after by many. It watches. It learns adapt to the ever-changing environment around it, even as the environment is wrought with corruption. It battles the corruption only when pressed or for the protection of others like it. It is a mirage that few will ever understand. It's a cornucopia of knowledge from an era long past. It's free. It's Bigfoot. My fantasies always consisted of making it big. My soul was nothing more than a bargaining chip. Marketing is what they tell you to do and what you're willing to give. Larking to the fullest extent. I don't wait, I shoot first like Han on a rodeo. And these people don't understand me like reading an Nokian. Stretch thin, like pulling an accordion. My heart ain't primordium. All these historians telling us lies. Setting aside everything is medicalized. Politicians selling the ride. I better but die where the relevance lies. They're dressing alike. Reptilians. My resilience is brilliant. I'm here to lead the rebellion on Hellion. Salient, alien with no melanin. I'm a Yeti hiding from Armageddon. Come and find me. I ain't even hiding. We ain't the same. I play no games. You do not know me. I don't hold back. I just speak facts. You cannot hold me. I'm under pressure. Oh, take back your strap.